According to a new Issue One report, quote, a dozen mega donors and their spouses contributed a combined $3.4 billion to federal candidates and political groups since just 2009. That accounts for nearly one out of every $13 raised. The list of 12 is split evenly among party lines. Bipartisan here, six registered Democrats and six registered Republicans were named. Editor-in-chief at The Real News and host of Working People podcast, Max Alvarez and Marshall Kosloff, co-host of The Realignment podcast, are back to discuss. Welcome back, guys. Thanks for having us. All right. Now, let me just get you, Max, to react to, to this report right off the bat. What does this tell you about the state of our politics right now? I mean, it tells me, you know, tells me I know what I'm talking about sometimes. <laughs> 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 a broken clock is right twice a day, right? Vindication. <laughs> right. I mean, and but to, to be serious, right? I mean, I know that maybe sometimes kind of the things that we talk about um, when we have our panels kind of together on this show may seem a little abstract, right? I know just thinking off the top of my head, right? We've had discussions about taxation, right? And the corporate tax rate. And, all, and I'm over here just constantly railing to people that you will never be able to get back everything that the ruling class has stolen from you, right? This is kind of what I mean, right? I mean, like the best way I can think to kind of describe it, right? Is, you know, that horrible scene that we all remember from Saving Private Ryan and take, take the Nazis, take the American side out of it. Just take the scene in itself when that one guy is like trying to slowly pushing the knife down, the other guy's trying to push it back and he can't. That is kind of the political situation that we've been in, whether it is this campaign finance stuff, whether it is constant and more tax breaks for the rich, whether it is huge bailouts for corporations, whether it is austerity for the poor and working classes, that knife has been constantly plunging down slower and slower while the people who had some power to do something about it stood cowardly by and did nothing, right? And this is just like what we're seeing. Like we have, we have seen this time and time again, and I think people feel really powerless against it so when they see stuff like this we go yeah i mean that that seems right that seems that seems like what i'm experiencing that seems like what i know what can i do about it so let me tell you who some of these people are um the single biggest spender was michael bloomberg second biggest spender was tom steyer and his wife um those are obviously both democrats uh, a lot of that spending went to their own uh failed quixotic bids um, the largest Republican contributor was Sheldon Adelson uh, and his wife, Miriam. Uh, and again, these donors, the mega donors were split evenly 50-50, Republicans and Democrats. I also liked this stat. Um, there was a lot of zip code inequality, too. They found that the top 100 zip codes for political giving, they hold less than 1% of the population, but they made up for about 20% or $45 billion of the giving. Some of these zip codes don't e aren't even really populated by people. They're primarily associated with skyscrapers and post office boxes that are used as business addresses by the wealthy marshal. That's straight out of coming apart. Well, look, here's the thing. Um, let's bring some happiness and positivity to our morning, <laughs> despite Max's opening there. Several How things. dare you, Marshall? That's what I'm, that's what I'm here to do. Um, number one. Bloomberg lost and was completely wrecked in 2020. Um, Tom Steyer lost and was completely wrecked. These people spent all this money and they couldn't buy the presidency. Once again, those Republican donors you're mentioning, Ricketts, TD, Ameritrade, all of those, they tried to beat Donald Trump in the, in the Republican primary and Trump beat them. Once again, the point here is not to claim that there aren't these really big systemic issues that Max is doing a really good job of articulating. And there's a whole broader conversation we need to have around the nature of like party primaries, the natures of like contribution limits, corporate taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But just in the let's just focus on the direct part to play with Max's metaphor. It's actually not the situation. The situation is not in this case that someone is plunging a knife into the people and there's nothing anyone could do. Actually, it's pretty straightforward. What they can do is defeat these candidates in primaries, which they are. It is now clear at this point that the American political system is just so complicated that you actually can't buy the presidency. That's just not true. Joe Biden, when he actually, like, despite all the, like, Obama made a phone call and all that different stuff during the primary, Joe Biden was in, was not raising that much money relative to his competitors, yet he still won. So I think if we focus on the electoral side of this and separate it from the structural economic inequalities part, there is some good news that should inform how we should be optimistic about being able to handle 
these issues. You know, Marshall makes a really interesting point, Max, which is that in the electoral side, we haven't seen the sort of transactional effectiveness that some people, I think, scaremonger about that happening. But at the same time, when you look at super zips, which is something that Charles Murray talks about and something that comes up in this report, it is structural. There are ways in which the concentration of people with a ton of money in a physical area has a lot of downstream effects. So first of all, do you think Marshall is correct to say money can't necessarily just buy the presidency? And second of all, what's the what's the layer beneath that? Well, first, I just I love uh, and I really appreciate Marshall's follow up. <laughs> it's like, OK, let's pump the brakes. We can all uh, you know, rejoice of the fact that Michael Bloomberg spent a whole lot of money for our failed campaign. That is good news to start <laughs> our day. So I agree. Um, we can still drink big gulps. That- Right. (laughs) There is a really interesting kind of um, point here to be made uh, and and just to kind of piggyback onto that. Um, You know, perhaps it does kind of speak to uh, the apparatus, right, the political apparatus of the Republican and the Democratic Party. Um, Right. Where, you know, especially on the left, right, a a, a big kind of narrative, because it has largely been true for most of our lives, right, is that the corporate interest and and kind of billionaire interests that fund the party are the ones whose interests are reflected in the party. Right. And and so I think that there was uh, always a danger that we started to kind of isolate, right, that small pool of people uh, and, and kind of assume that the Democratic Party as such fundamentally mirrored it be, mirrored it because it wanted to but what we have seen not only with bernie sanders campaign with all the small donations but also as this article points out that kind of the challenge has been coming from small online donations and we have started to actually see some impacts on that on the legislative side joe manchin just came out and said he would support the pro act right i mean like and 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 there is some sort of bottom up pressure i don't know how big it is but i think it is true and it is worth kind of stating right that the mechanisms of the party do seem to be a little more agnostic that maybe we gave them credit for and a little more responsive to whoever is lining their purses, right? You know, whoever whoever's putting the most money in does get some more control over the party apparatus. And I think that there's, there's a discussion to be had about what we can do with that. The person to watch here is Ed Markey, who came in as like more sort of just mainline establishment figure, but then really relied on a grassroots young activist base in order to win his primary against Joe Kennedy, who thought since he had the last name Kennedy, he, you know, was heir apparent to that seat. I want to see if it changes how Ed Markey behaves in the Senate, because I think that would be an interesting tell of exactly what you guys are talking about. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Great to see you both. Thanks. Thank you. Coming up, Brianna Joy Gray joins us to discuss Dems' reaction to the Chauvin verdict when rising continues.